Good morning. Okay. <laughs> How's everybody doing this morning? A little bit warmer. That's okay. We're going to get more snow, and I guess that's okay too. But anyway, I'm up here because my husband is just having a little problem with his eyes. And um, it hurts him not to be up here, and I know that. And, uh, but I got your back, honey. Got your back. Okay. Today's reading of the scripture is 1 John 5. 1 through 5. What does BSB mean? Oh, okay. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father also loves those born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome, because everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who then overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So be it. If you bow your heads, we'll start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that we can come here and worship you freely. Lord, we take these things for granted in a world that is being persecuted for, for proclaiming your name. Lord, help us to take the commission that you've given us, Lord, the power that resides inside of us, to take it seriously. Lord, help us to have our spirits entwined with your spirit, to hear your words, to not only just hear them, but to be obedient to them, to live a life that brings you glory and honor, to be compelled by your spirit and not compelled by the things of the world. Lord, we thank you for the privilege and honor that we have for being ambassadors for Christ. And we just thank you for the freedom that we can come here and worship you and train ourselves up so that we can rightly handle the word of truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've talked to you about several things, and I had no idea where I was going exactly this year. They just kind of popped in together. Um, last week I talked about Jesus proving his love for you, and the fact that he never said in Scripture, I love you to anyone. But he did ask them if they loved him. He asked Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? He said, if you love me, you will do this and you will do that. Because God's love for you is so obvious if you'll just open up your eyes if you'll open up your ears and see and hear what God has done for you that God himself would become flesh and blood and then not only live an example for us but lay down his life for us all because he wants to be in a right relationship with you and with all of mankind so it is our privilege our honor our duty our commission, our ambassadorship, so forth and so on, to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. To not live as though we are uh, consumed by the things of this world, but by the, the things of this world are a blessing from God, and we should use everything that we have to bring Him glory and honor. So I entitled this message, Living as Proof, Our Response Back. And probably next week... I'll go into some things of what love looks like in the Bible. But what I want to talk about today is basically looking at 1 John. He wrote this letter to the church many years afterwards, before Revelation came, but many years afterwards, because the church was facing so many things. Persecution like we could not even imagine. But all of the things in the world that tries their best to water them down, to make them inactive, because we're fighting a spiritual battle and Satan does not want us to bring glory and honor to God. He does not want us to lead other people. He doesn't want us to shepherd. He wants us to be like him, to be a thief that actually takes them away. Blind guides leading the blind to the pit of destruction. So last week I told you that Jesus never said, I love you but he proved it with everything that he did, every breath that he took. And I gave you some examples and embarrassed my wife a little bit, and that was fine. She, she got over it. 
fact, I think she was tickled a little bit. And we don't normally celebrate Valentine's Day, but that was nice, right, sweetheart? Okay, yeah, we're all good. <laughs> Showing that you love someone says a lot more than the words ever do. And in fact, if you don't show them, then the words are kind of meaningless. You can profess all day long that you're a Christian, but unless you live like a Christian, then you know what you'll probably be labeled as? A hypocrite. And the sad thing is that the church in the world today is labeled that so strongly, especially the church in the United States, because they don't live like Christ in this world. Or they've accepted another gospel. And look at all the letters that were written for that reason. That you can live your life by yourself. You can, you can go to church or not go to church. You can be active or not be active. You can give your little tithe. Or you can give out of the abundance of your heart that Jesus has given you everything. The thing is, as Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, he must Deny himself, forget about the world and all its comforts, trust in him, take up your cross, whatever suffering comes your way, to know that God has everything in control. He will take care of you. You don't need to fear the world, you need to fear the one that has authority to throw your soul into hell. But you don't have to fear him, and we'll get to that, because perfect love casts out all fear. And then... We can follow in the footsteps of Jesus. To have life and have it abundant. To have joy like we've never seen. Peace that surpasses all understanding. And eternal life. That's what we get when we leave this world. We know that we will forever be with Jesus and have eternal life and have everything that is good. Because we live in a fallen world because we have chosen to sin. And things should be a lot worse than they are. Because we sinned against God, but He is still good and righteous and holy and wants to draw men to Him. So He provides the rain and the snow and the sunshine for everyone, not just for us, so that we can be a light to the world and draw others to Christ. How? By loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. But do we try to justify who our neighbor is? And I'll talk a little bit about, more about that today. So we've gone over the great commandment, the greatest commandment, the great commission. We went over a new fishing philosophy that Jesus would make you fishers of men. We went over his P.S. I love you letters to stay firm and to continue to look to him as his first love and not to be lukewarm or anything. If you have ears, then you better listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. You should live as though you have eternal life. Not live that you'll get eternal life, but live as a child of the kingdom of heaven now. Not live like the religious leaders of that day who were actually the thieves instead of shepherding their people. And don't you all want to become overcomers? What does that mean? Overcomers means one that has obtained the victory. And as we saw from the songs already and from the scripture already, the one that has overcome is the one who simply puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But as James says, show me your faith without works, you can't because it's dead. If you believe in Jesus Christ, then you are an overcomer. So live like you've overcame the world. Plain and simple. Satan has no authority or no power over you. Death has no sting for you. You are a new creation in Christ. God's masterpiece. Live like that. I think everybody here wants to be an overcomer. Jesus continually told us that we are overcomers, but he also says make sure that we continue to be overcomers. Now, I'm not going to go down that path of whether you lose your salvation or anything. I'm going to concentrate on if you are an overcomer, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, live like it. You don't want to be ashamed that day. That's what our whole motto of, of our verse for Awanas is to study, to, to show thyself an approved workman unto God so that you won't be ashamed. You can rightly handle the word of truth so you can come 
when people come to you, you can give them the right answers. That you can say simply, yes, it is important that you're part of the body of Christ, that you are active in the church. Because if you're not, it's like me without one arm here. Because you're not giving the gifts that the Spirit has given you to help the body of Christ. So that you can understand doctrines that, yes, what it says in here is what it says in here. We can't water down one part of it or take one part of it away or it doesn't change over time. God's Word is eternal. It is true. It will endure forever and ever and ever. And Jesus is, He is the words of life. So let's start there in 1 John chapter 5 with our scripture first. Verse 1, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ... They have been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father also loves those born of Him. So you've got your faith that makes you a child of God, and then because you're a child of God, you love God and you love others, right? There it is. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments, all of them. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. They're to bring us peace and joy. Show us the right way to live. Show us that thinking of others over ourselves is a much better way than to think about ourselves all the time. God's going to provide for us anyway. Why should you worry about what you eat or what you wear? The birds of the field don't worry about that, do they? But God loves them and takes care of them. How much more are you worth than them? His commandments are not burdensome because everyone born of God overcomes the world. There it is. You have already overcome the world. So many times we think that we've got to overcome the world. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, you have overcome this world. All those things that you're struggling with, you don't need to be struggling with anymore. Get rid of them. God gives you the power to live a holy, set-apart life that brings Him glory and honor. Look at Israel and see how they didn't, but yet God gave them everything. Look how they missed the promised land because they feared the giants in the land. But then 40 years later when Caleb and Joshua go in, they say, we were scared of you because they recognized who God really was and the children of Israel didn't because they feared men more than they feared and loved God. Learn from the mistakes of others in the Bible so that you can live a life that brings glory and honor to God. And help edify and build up the body of Christ, not tear them down. Pray for them. Build them up. Strengthen them. Tell them that you need their arm into the body. They need to be an active part. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. It is our faith. Who then overcomes the world? Only who, he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. You're an overcomer. Don't worry about it. You are an overcomer. You don't have to worry. You don't have to fret. You do have eternal life. So live as though you belong to the kingdom of God already. Jesus said when he started his public ministry, repent. Repent. For the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Change the way you think. It's not about you. You don't have to fear things. You don't have to think. You don't have the power to do them. You need to live as Christ lived in this world, combined with each other, brothers and sisters in Christ, and live as Jesus. And greater things you will do than he did. So here we are to John writing this letter. So now I'm going to go back to 1 John chapter 1. And we're just going to go through this if you'll turn in your Bibles. I'm reading from the NLT. But this is, which is New Living Translation. This is the letter that John's writing to the church because they're facing so many things, physical and spiritual, that are trying to keep them from being the church, the body of Christ. But Jesus will build His church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. John writes these words to encourage them, to tell them that they have already overcome and that the way they're going to overcome this world is to love in spite of being persecuted, to love in spite of not having enough to take care of your own needs, to love even though you see your brothers and sisters being burned alive, to love because God first loved them. 
They know that they have eternal security and they need to tell this world about God's love by showing them God's love so that you bring them out of the darkness and into the light. Bring them from destruction to eternal life. So in 1 John chapter 1, it starts this way. We pro proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the words of life. This one who is life was revealed to us and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal. He was with the Father and then was revealed to us. We proclaim to you that we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship. The word is koinonia in the Greek. To have fellowship, community, communion, intimacy, a relationship. That relationship that was destroyed when we sinned, God wants to restore exponentially to you. And if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, as we see as we continue to read this letter, you are an overcomer. You already are in that relationship. So live like it. So that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. Now I want you to think about that just a second. But all the disciples have pretty much been martyred. The church is being persecuted. And John still writes, Hey, I saw Jesus, the one who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I saw Him. I saw the Son of God. I know everything that happened is true. Put your faith and trust in Him. I am a new creation in Christ because I'm not running and hiding. No one is telling me that what I believe is not true, no matter what trying to stamp that out. You've got to live as though you truly believe what you say you believe. Or in fact, maybe you don't believe it. This is the message, verse 5, that we heard from Jesus, and now we declare to you, God is light and there is no darkness in Him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but let, go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. So the first thing is God requires His people to be holy, just like He always has. To not have any darkness. Whatever those things are they are hiding in your closet, get them out of there, get rid of them. What association does light have with darkness? If you're in fellowship with Jesus, He has called you into the light. And he says those that don't come in the light, going back to John chapter 3, don't want to be exposed because their deeds are evil. If you're born again, get rid of the darkness out of, the, out of your life so that your light can shine. And then how does your light shine? By your good works that glorify your Father in heaven. So first, you're called to be holy. And then it goes on to say right here, if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other other. He doesn't say we have fellowship with God then or with Jesus then because he's already stated that. But we now have fellowship with one another. I love you. <laughs> Imagine that. Because that's a crazy thing. How can I love people that are so different than me, that irk me so, that whatever it is. <laughs> Except that I love them because God loved them and I shouldn't think of myself more highly than them. I should realize that I was an enemy of the cross just like them when I drove the nails into Jesus' hands and feet. But He loved me anyway. So I can't look down on anyone and say, you don't deserve salvation. I have to look at them lovingly and say, I want to show you what salvation is. And I need to love them and show them acts of kindness to show that. Because without it, my love is just nothing but hypocrisy. It's only words. It doesn't have the actions that prove it. Verse 8, If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sin to Him, there you go, no, get it out and to put it in the light, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness or unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that His Word has no place in our hearts. So here's the first thing. Is there any sin in your life that needs to be exposed? Well, that's a tough one, I know. 
But is there any sin in your life? And I could give plenty of examples. Might hit a nail on the head, but I would be hitting them on my own head too, probably. So whenever the Spirit convicts you of something, don't take it lightly. If He says you need to go make amends to your wife, go make amends to your wife. If He says I need to go, you need to go do this, then go do this. If the Spirit of God is dwelling with your spirit and tells you that something you are doing is wrong, then it's wrong. And you need to live as a child of light. 1 John chapter 2, My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. There you go. You've got the power not to sin. That is God's goal. Jesus said to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. So nothing that you ever do is going to separate you from God's love. No sin before the fact, after the fact is going to separate you. You are already an overcomer. You are born again if you in fact believe. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. Verse 2, He Himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. And not only for our sins, but the sins of all the world. And we can be sure that we know Him if... We obey His commandments. Now that means all the holy commandments, but that means the commandments also that Jesus summed up, right? To love your neighbor or to love your enemy. And Jesus told us how to do that again. If your enemy asks you for your coat, then you give him your shirt also. That's deep. That's tough. But why would you keep anything from your enemy if it means drawing them to Jesus Christ? Now, yeah, you can rationalize, well, if he didn't need my, my shirt, why should I give it to him and everything? But sometimes we just need to walk by faith and give them whatever. Because then if we do again and the world is withholding something, then they're going to really say, why in the world did he give me his shirt also? What kind of Christian is this? Is he genuine? Tell me more about your Jesus so that I can get to know why you are different, why you're a new creation. Maybe we need to walk by faith, not by sight. Hmm. Verse 4, If someone claims I know God, but doesn't obey His commandments, that person is a liar and he's not living in the truth. But those who obey God's Word truly show how completely they love Him. Oh, so you're saying if I give Him my shirt on top of that, it shows that I am relying on Him to get another shirt so that I don't freeze to death? That he'll cover my nakedness and shame. I don't have to worry about it. Let me take. No, I'm not doing that. Sorry. <laughs> not happening. <laughs> Yesterday I came. We have the kids. Kira and Isaac are back there if you didn't know. And I came out of the closet because she said something. And I got a different shirt on. I only have five shirts over there. So you guys haven't seen this one this year. Or these pants because I had them still at the house. But I came out without my shirt on. She said, why are you naked? <laughs> I was like, I don't know. Why am I? Just the innocence of the children. But see, when you get, let yourself get vulnerable for Jesus, it shows how completely you love Him. That nothing else matters. To be a fool for Jesus is a great thing. To be labeled as a Jesus freak, whatever it is. Because it says that you don't care about anything else but your love for Jesus and being obedient and loving for Him. Verse 5, but those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love Him. That is how we know we are living in Him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Boy, now that puts up a difference, don't it? I believe He was naked in front of us, beaten, ridiculed, had a crown of thorns put on His head, was whipped, mocked, everything else. And instead of saying anything negative, He said... Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. They, we should live our lives as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it is the old one that you have heard from the very beginning, just like Jesus said. It's there in the Old Testament. If you look, if you look through it, if you go back and read the Old Testament right now, with that attitude, you'll see that those laws, a lot of them were so that you wouldn't take advantage of your neighbor. You wouldn't take advantage of the poor. The poor will always be among you and just maybe the reason that you have what you have is because God blessed you so that you'd give them. 
And after 50 years, everything's going to go back. It's the year of Jubilee, and all of your property and everything's going to be given back for you. Do you want to resent that, or do you want to say, hey, you know, it's right. Now these people over here don't have to suffer while I'm living in luxury because they're just as much a human being as I am and have every right to become a child of God because it's not by works of righteousness what we've done, but by His mercy, His love, His grace that He has offered us salvation. But we continually worry about things. We have idols that we love more than we love God, other affections that we share our love with. <clears throat> Dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it's an old one you have heard from the very beginning. This old commandment is to love one another. It's the same message you heard before, yet it is also new because of the way Jesus lived his life. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment, and you are also living it. Now, this is the first church. We're not talking about you and I. We're talking about the first church. I said again, they're being persecuted, They've had their possessions taken from them. They're seeing people die around them, and they have joy because they can be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, that they can read God's Word together even if they have to go do it in secrecy, that they study Scripture. So if the written text is taken from them, they still have that hidden in their hearts so that they might not sin against their God. They take seriously the eternal life that will be rewarded to them, and they live as a child of the kingdom of heaven here and now in this world. In Acts, when you read Acts, it says that many people sold their property because they didn't consider it to be their own so that they could distribute that to people that had less. That's how the church lived. And the new commandment that is new but is old is we live as Jesus lived this commandment. And this church is living that way. And if you notice the next part, the darkness is disappearing. I, I scratched my head on that one. Because the darkness is so bad, so obvious in the world against the Christians, but yet the darkness is disappearing because the church grew daily in numbers, isn't it? So the darkness, even though the darkness looks like it's getting even darker, pitch black, light exposes the darkness. And you're the light of the world if you have Jesus' light in you. So are we living that way in our community? Is the darkness decreasing? Is our light penetrating this world? Or do we need to make some improvements? And the true light is already shining. Verse 9, If anyone claims I'm living in the light but hates a fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates a fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. I am writing to you who are God's children because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus Christ. I am writing to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I am writing to you who are young in the faith because you have won the battle with the evil one. I have written to you who are God's children because you know the Father. I have written to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I have written to you who are young in the faith because you are strong. God's word lives in your hearts and you have won your battle with the evil one. That is awesome. It covers all of God's children, weak, strong, mature, not mature, whatever you want to say young, old, no matter how young you are, as Paul said to, to Timothy, don't let them despise your youth. No matter how old you are, you're still breathing. You can still tell people about Jesus. Here's what he said. Your sins have been forgiven. You know Christ. You've won your battle. You know the Father. You know Christ. You are strong. You have won your battle. Well, it sure seems like this church is <laughs> fighting a losing battle, doesn't it? But you're already an overcomer. Live like that. That's what John is saying to a persecuted church so they don't give up their faith. Same things that Jesus echoes years later when he writes to John or tells John to write these things down in the book of Revelation. Hold on to your faith and overcome. Don't let the evil one take it from you. 
Verse 15, do not love this world nor the things it offers. Bam, right there it is, right after the other. Because what's going to distract you is the love for someone else. Fall back to your first love. Love Jesus like He means everything. Show Him. Don't just tell her you love her. Show her. Embarrass her a little bit even. But I guarantee you she'll feel a little special. Do not love this world nor the things it offers, for when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the, for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievement and possessions. It sounds like the United States for sure. These are not from the Father, but they are from the world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Dear children, the last hour is here. I'm going to skip down to verse 26. I'm writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. Satan uses others to water down your faith so that you are not the light that you should be. Do you really want to, when you meet Jesus face to face, answer Him for why you let someone else water you down or why you let something water you down? Or do you want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant? Verse 27, but you have received the Holy Spirit and He lives within you, so you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know and what He teaches is true. It's not a lie. So just as He has taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. And now, dear children, remain in fellowship with Christ so that when He does return, he will be full, you will be full of courage and not shrink back, shrink back from Him in shame. Since we know that Christ is righteous, we also know that all who do what is right are God's children. Are you doing what is right in the sight of God? 1 John chapter 3, See how much your Father loves us, that He calls us His children. <laughs> I'm God's child. He could have called me whatever, but Scripture here says that He calls me His child. Man, what good father doesn't love his child and wants to give that, want to give that child everything? He's your heritage. It's a blessing from the Lord. God gave us each other, male and female, marriage, before sin ever entered into the world, and the ability to have children. Those things were before we sinned. What good father does not want to give his child good things? See how much our father has loved us? <laughs> Jesus? Come on. What greater love could there be? It might sound like foolishness to the world, but we who understand that, God did that for you. For He calls us His children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we're God's children because they don't know Him. And they're not going to recognize us as God's children if we don't live like God's children. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but He has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will all be like Him. For we will see Him as He really is the love that He really has. We won't see it physical, we'll see the scars probably that will show us His love, but we'll see spiritually the love that God has for us. Verse 3, And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure, just as He is pure. Everyone who is sinning is breaking God's law. I'm going to skip down to verse 10. So now we can tell, tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers love other believers should love one another. Two things. Holy and set apart, and you'll know them by your love. We must not be like Cain. Now we get an example. He killed his literal brother who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because Cain had been doing what was evil and his brother had been doing what is righteous. 
How can he love his brother if what he's doing is evil? You've got to get rid of the sin in your life and be holy so that you can love. And then the new commandment is to love as Christ loved. Verse 13, So don't be surprised, dear brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. If we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And, know, and you know that murderers do not have eternal life within them. Verse 16, We know what real love is, is because, because Jesus gave up His life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. Now the King, I mean the NLT used brothers and sisters. The word is just brothers. It can mean those in faith, but it can also mean just like your neighbor. It mirrors John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whosoever believes in Him should, have, should not perish but have eternal life. And we know, verse, 1 John 3, 16, what real love is because Jesus did that for us. So what should we do? Love one another. Verse 17, if someone has enough money to live well, wait a minute, why is this verse next? You get the example right here that the church was facing then and the church faces now. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother and sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Now we're talking about a church that was poor because most of the things had been taken from them. Shouldn't they hold on to what they still have? Because if they get rid of that, who's going to provide for them? God, just like He provides for the birds. But we hold on to things because we want more things or because we think that we don't have enough faith in God that He'll supply those things. What if we truly live like Jesus in this world? Would the light be stamping out the darkness just as it did in the early church? Or do we want to justify who is my brother? just like the uh, leader of the law wanted to justify who his neighbor was. How did Jesus answer that question? The one who had compassion, even on his enemy, because the Samaritan would have been the enemy to the Jew that had fell to the hand of the fate of the robbers, who did nothing to cause what happened to him. It just happened. But the Samaritan was the one that helped while the priest and the Levite were thieves and taking away from the fellow brother that needed help. Verse 18, Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth so we'll be confident when we stand before God. Even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings and He knows everything. Dear friends, we don't feel, if we don't feel guilty, we can come to God with bold confidence. And we shall receive from Him whatever we ask because we obey Him and do all things that pleases Him. And this is His command. We must believe in the name of the Son of Jesus Christ. And what comes next? You follow along? Love one another. Just as He commanded us, those who obey God's commandments remain in fellowship with Him and he, he with them. And, he know, and we know He lives in us because the Spirit He gave, gave us lives in us. 1 John chapter 4, But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the Spirit who lives in you is greater than the Spirit who lives in the world. Why would you wrestle with the thoughts that you're not equipped you don't have enough already. You're too old. You're too young. Whatever it is, those are lies from the devil. You are an overcomer. You have everything you need. Even if you live in poverty and give your only two mites to help someone else, then that offering, Jesus said, was greater than what the rest of the people gave because she gave out of what she did not have because she had faith that God would supply even a poverty level for her. For her. Verse 6, but we belong to God. 
And those who know God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. This is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another. Do you see a pattern here? Love comes from God, and anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But if anyone, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much He loved us by sending His Son, His one and only Son, into the world so that we might have eternal life through Him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Verse 11, Dear friends, since God loved us that much, what does it say? Surely we ought to love each other. I hope you get the pattern here. I hope you see Jesus' words from His letters, Jesus' commands back in the Gospels, and John is telling this persecuted church to continue to love one another, not in just word, but in action. Even if it means doing without so that you can help someone else. Verse 12, No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and His love is brought to full expression in us. The world sees God's love because of our love that we give unconditionally even to our enemies. It's a pretty clear pattern. It's a clear teaching that's been from the beginning of God's Word to the end. Why would you not do it? What are the reasons keeping you from doing it? It's either fear or idol, uh, idolatry. Fear that you won't have enough or the idols that you don't want these things taken away. Tell me something else if it's not. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And not only that, God loved you enough that He sent His one and only begotten Son to save you from this world for all eternity. Are you an overcomer? Then live like an overcomer. I'm going to skip down to verse 16. We know how much God loves us and we have put our trust in His love. God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. We become more like Christ. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. So if we're not growing in love, will we be afraid on the day of judgment? Just putting that out there. But instead, we can face Him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. There's the standard. Don't say that you can't achieve it because God's Spirit lives inside of you. And Jesus said, greater things you would do than He did. Verse 18, such love, what kind of love? Love like Jesus. Has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. So you don't worry about where your next meal is coming from. What man can do to you anything else? The worst thing that can happen is you will starve to death or somebody will kill you and you will spend an eternity with God. I think I'll take eternity. Does it mean I won't be scared to getting there? No, but it means that I'll have to rely even more and trust even more on God. When do you run to God in the first place? Come on, be honest. When something happens in your life that you're scared of, cancer, a friend, whatever it is, it's, whatever those things are, your prayer life steps up. Come on, be honest. But we're supposed to have that faith all the way through. Did Jesus even sweat drops of blood? Yes. But He said, not my will be done, but yours, God. He had to rely on the Spirit, trust God, that God's plan was perfect. And God will reconcile all things to Him. Perfect love casts out fear. All fear. If we are afraid, it's for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced His perfect love. We love each other because He first loved us. If what someone says, I love God but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And He has given us this command. wonder what it is. 
Those who love God must also love each other. Now yours might say brother or fellow believers, but the word is brother again, which can mean any humankind, any of mankind. So now we're to our scripture that we had, Polly read at the beginning, 1 John chapter 5. She read from the Berrien Study Bible, and it read this way, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father also loves those born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome, because everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. It is our faith. Who then overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you see where John is getting at in this letter? Here's how the NLT reads since I've read from the NLT. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his children also. We know that we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For every child of God defeats this evil world. That's why I wanted to read you that one. You have already defeated this world. You are an overcomer. Are you living like it? I've said it over and over again, but I know when I say that to myself, I know I at least have to hear, and I think of the ways that I'm not living as an overcomer, the things that I do fear. Yeah, I'll give you one example. It's our house. I said, I've got to get this house on the market before election. Because when the election happens, this country's going to pot. How many of you said the same thing? I'm looking at you, John, because I know you have. <laughs> We're in a world of hurt. Because this country, at least with Trump, there was some freedom of religion. We don't know what we're going to have now. But is God not sovereign? Does it matter what the economy is? Well, all things distracted me from getting the house sold. When we got the offer for our house, it is sold. It came in on inauguration day of the new president. <laughs> wow. He is so much bigger than all of our fears. And I know that's silly. But he is so much bigger than all of our fears. And He knows every hair on your head. He formed you in your mother's womb. And He sent His Son to die for you. You are beloved by God. So loved that He would call you His child. Don't let the devil lie to you. Don't let someone else water down your faith. Live as though you truly, truly believe it. That chapter goes on to say in verse 19, I'm going to skip down there. We know that we are children of God and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. We're not supposed to be. And we know that the Son of God has come and He has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the only true God and He is eternal life. Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your heart. We're right back to the letters where Jesus starts in Revelation. Where, where have you, why have you fallen from your first love? This I have against you. All the deeds that they did and everything were great and wonderful, but meant nothing because they had fallen out of love with the one who loved them enough to give his life for them. Where are you at in this relationship? If you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are an overcomer. You need to live as though you are proof of that. That the world sees Christ in you. Are you living that way? Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for you are a loving, loving, loving God. You created us to be in fellowship with you. And then we put ourselves above you. And instead of you just snuffing us out, you continue to put up with all the things that we did. You called a nation to love you and to show others the truth. And they couldn't live by the law. We should have been doomed even more. But at just the right time, while we were still enemies, 
you sent your only son to show us what the law really means, to show us that we need to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, and to love others. Because if we do know the love of God, we know it because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. We have your spirit living inside of us, communing with our spirit, that we can worship in spirit and in truth. And that's the only way that we can love one another, which is your plan all along. Father, help us to love one another, to prove that we are overcomers, to draw people from darkness into the light. And Father, we do thank you for the freedoms that we have in this country, the freedom that we have at this point to not be persecuted for our faith. Let us take advantage of it while there is still some light in our country. And Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for the leaders. Lord, we pray for a revival in this country. And Lord, we know that it starts with your people. Lord, help us to be prayerfully dependent upon you, to be empowered by the Spirit, and to live as kingdom children. We thank you and praise you that you would call us your child. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.